Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. So the, the, uh, this conference is about the future of central banking. Yesterday we, we had sessions on the future of macroeconomics, uh, the future of monetary policy, which of course are topics which would be uh, on the program anywhere in the world where there was a, a conference about the future of central banking. But of course here in Europe uh, it's necessary to have a third conversation uh, which is uh, relating to the unique nature of the European uh, monetary union where we have a single monetary policy, a single central bank, but of course 19 member countries. And of course, it's, this is a much broader conversation than the role of the uh, central bank, but uh, it's, the central bank, ECB, the euro system, of course, has to be super aware of the uh, nature of a monetary union and the constraints uh, associated with the architecture at a given point in time. Uh, so I think uh, in dis discussing the future of EMU, it's especially helpful to people who have been involved in this debate uh, even uh, before uh, the Euro uh, was launched. Uh, so I think the, the design of this panel is, is uh, very appropriate uh, given the lineup of speakers. I should say also, I just went back and I checked to see uh, what Vitor had uh, written on this uh, topic before. I wouldn't claim uh, to have searched the full uh, Portuguese uh, archives of, from the 1990s, uh, but I did find in the uh, 2004 ECB Central Banking Conference, uh, uh, Vitor gave a very interesting, uh, wrote a very interesting essay uh, on the uh, experience of Portugal so far, uh, and uh, I would encourage you to actually to go back and uh, read that. It's very much uh, consistent with uh, the dinner speech from Jean-Claude Trichet last night. Uh, a lot of concern about imbalances, a lot of concern about the absence of self correct mechanisms within the euro area um, and of course uh, it's everyone uh, looking back in time uh, uh, rerunning history what we knew then and what we know now uh, it's, it's it's a really an ongoing conversation uh, so this morning uh, uh, let me first turn to uh, uh, the, the, the first uh, presentation which is from uh, Barry Eichengreen so Barry over to you Thank you, um, Philip, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Management, which uh, means both the organizing team and, and Vitor Constancio asked, have asked me to, uh, to talk about new developments in the, in the theory of monetary unions or optimum currency area theory. So this could, in principle, be a very short talk. Um, one way of viewing the literature is that there has been remarkably uh, little new theorizing about uh, the nature of monetary union since the advent of the euro. One could make a stronger statement that there's been relatively little new theorizing since Mundell, 1961. But I think there is is uh, an important new strand in the literature which emphasizes uh, financial factors, cross-border financial flows within the monetary union, and financial fragility issues that were sadly neglected by the fathers and mothers of optimum currency area theory and could, could have attracted more attention as well, I think, up, I think in the run-up to the euro in 1999, and, and, and Vitor has been a, a significant figure, I think, in contributing to that discussion uh, about the role of finance, the role of imbalances within the eurozone, and, and, and those new developments. So when I think about this topic, I am naturally drawn, uh, I, I am a, a prisoner of my own earlier work, as many of us are. I think this article may be my most widely cited in uh, economics, closing in on, on 2,000 citations last time I looked, which is uh, testimony to the intellectual uh, heft of my co-author, Tam Bayumi, at uh, the International Monetary Fund. Um, the conclusion of, of that piece, which was published happily exactly 25 years ago, 
1993, um, was that uh, proceeding with a large monetary union uh, encompassing not only the, the European core or the northern European countries, but also uh, southern Europe or peripheral Europe or the Club Med countries, as they were sometimes called it at the time, was problematic. Uh, so we built on the, directly on the theory of optimum currency areas, such as, as it was, it is, which uh, looks at, at a, a, a number of uh, preconditions for the existence of a smoothly functioning monetary union, where in this paper we, we, we looked both at the nature of business cycle disturbances and how correlated or not they were uh, across potential constituent states of the monetary union. We looked also at some aspects of the adjustment mechanism, whether the adjustment mechanism indicated faster uh, uh, adjustment reflecting greater labor mobility, for example, in some cases than others. But it was really the symmetry or asymmetry of disturbances across the constituent member states that we focused on. The basic framework could not be simpler. It was a, a straightforward uh, aggregate support supply aggregate demand uh, set up in which uh, uh, aggregate demand shocks raise output temporarily as you shift the downward sloping aggregate demand curve uh, to the right and, and, and prices. But over time, the system rotates back toward the uh, unchanged vertical long run aggregate supply curve where uh, there is no uh, long run or permanent impact on the level of output, but there is an impact uh, on the level of prices. Contrasting, contrasted with uh, an aggregate supply shock where you shift both the short run and the long run aggregate supply curves to the right, meaning that uh, both uh, output rises and prices decline permanently in the long run. So, we uh, estimated these two relationships using time series on, on, on prices and output, country by country, actually the uh, percentage changes in, in, in prices and output. We distinguished two shocks or, or disturbances, uh, one that was constrained to affect output only temporarily, but prices permanently, the aggregate, so-called aggregate demand shock and uh, a, a second shock that was allowed to affect both output and prices <laughs> permanently, the permanent or so-called aggregate supply shock. Um, so we estimated this uh, bivariate uh, vector autoregression in uh, prices and output with these structural uh, restrictions imposed. We looked at how correlated, how symmetric or asymmetric <laughs> the estimated uh, uh, shocks were across uh, countries, and we compared the situation in different uh, candidate member states in, in, in Europe with that in the United States, where we distinguished a dozen or so uh, census regions, where uh, the thought experiment for Europe was how correlated were these temporary and permanent aggregate demand and aggregate supply shocks in different countries, how correlated were they with those in Germany, uh, in, in the case of the United States, the center or anchor region that we mostly worked with was the, uh, the middle Atlantic states. This is what, uh, what we found uh, uh, when we had data up through 1988. We found that the correlation of, uh, 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 of shocks with those in, in uh, the anchor country or region were lower in Europe than in the United States. So in principle, you want to be in the upper right-hand corner of these boxes, where you have a high correlation of demand shocks um, on the vertical axis and, and uh, supply shocks on the horizontal. And you can see there's more such clustering in the case of US regions than there is uh, in, in the case of European countries. And you can see in, in, in the top panel as well that there was uh, uh, a clear distinction between two groups of European countries, uh, uh, a European core where the correlation of, uh, of shocks was quite similar in some sense to that evident among U.S. regions. 
and then a second group of countries where everybody now knows uh, who they were, Portugal, Ireland, Italy, Greece, Spain, and the UK, where the correlation was noticeably lower. So that was uh, the basis for our conclusion that uh, a subset of European countries did not obviously fail to meet this precondition for a smoothly operating monetary union uh, uh, along US lines, but they're but, uh, proceeding with a large monetary union, including these um, peripheral, so-called peripheral European countries would be much more problematic. So here's the, uh, the update using data now, basically from 1994 through uh, 2014. Um, European countries obviously in red and, and uh, US regions in blue. The red dots are still further from the uh, upper right-hand corner of the, the, the quasi box. Europe still looks less like an optimum currency area than does the United States, judged on this particular criterion, uh, um, the red dots for Europe tend to be lower and, and, and further to the left. The US data points do not look very different from before. There are some small differences in the correlation with uh, mid-Atlantic reflecting, I think, changes in the geography of manufacturing activity in the United States over the last couple of decades. But the, the results for the US, and I'll show you some further results for the US in a moment, are, are um, quite similar to what we found uh, a quarter of a century ago. Europe looks a little bit more like an optimum currency area today than it did using the pre-1989 data. So in, in this figure, the blue dots are European correlations with, with Germany in the period up through 1988. And the red dots are the correlations with Germany for the same countries using the data from 1994. Um, the red red dots uh, 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 red dots are a little bit further to the right, reflecting mainly a, a stronger correlation of aggregate demand shocks, which some might say is a logical implication of the fact that the monetary disturbances affecting these uh, economies are now. Um, more similar. Um, what's unexpected in this figure is that the correlation of disturbances, the correlation of, of uh, demand shocks uh, especially, but supply shocks uh, as, as well, um, has grown more symmetric with those in Germany, not in the northern European countries, but in the crisis countries. It's in um, in Greece, in uh, uh, Ireland, in Spain, in that group of countries where the correlation with uh, Germany is has gone up and is greatest. So that was the, the big surprise of our update. We went back and checked our code four times to be sure this was not a, a, a programming error, and we are very <laughs> confident at this point that it's not. So something else is going on here that needs to be understood. Our interpretation of what's going on is that this correlation reflects capital flows between Northern and Southern Europe on a scale that tied these economies together on a scale that did not exist prior to, to the Euro. So to put it in, in simple terms, large capital flows from Germany to the South uh, led those economies to boom together between 2001 and 2008, and then you know, Germany uh, slows down uh, after the global financial crisis, and uh, the capital flow reverses, direct, reverses direction. The peripheral European economies slow down as well. So we then went on to look at how these correlations were affected by introducing financial factors into the model into the vector autoregression. So we introduced real interest rates, um, we introduced real credit growth, and we introduced the change in, in real housing prices to link back to the discussions that we had yesterday afternoon. And when you do that, the correlation of disturbances between Germany and uh, the peripheral European countries uh, goes down to much, much 
lower levels. So we interpret that as being consistent with the idea that it is financial factors and financial flows that are driving this new pattern. There is, in addition, another twist. If you have a simple two uh, bivariate uh, vector autoregression, you can shock it and look at the impulse response functions. Um, in our earlier study, the impulse re response functions were well behaved. When you subject the system to an aggregate supply shock, in the US, as I show you here, but in Europe as well, you get the uh, predicted uh, increase in output and decline in prices. The, the red line there shows you the impulse response, and when you subject the system to an aggregate demand shock, prices and output rise in the short run, and then by constraint, uh, output falls back to its initial level. Nothing in, in the way we estimate this model dictates which way prices ought to move, and we found it quite reassuring earlier that prices moved in the theoretically correct expected direction in response to the temporary and, and permanent shocks. That gave us confidence that we could loosely refer to these as aggregate supply and aggregate demand shocks. Uh, and, and in other words, there's a correspondence between the model and the impulse responses, as you see here. Um, now we continue to find exactly the same thing for the United States, but the impulse responses for Europe look peculiar. Now, positive supply shocks raise output, but also raise prices where the textbook aggregate supply demand model suggests prices ought to go down, positive demand shocks reduce prices where the textbook aggregate supply aggregate demand model says uh, uh, they should raise them. So these are our well-behaved impulse responses for the, the, uh, the United States. Here are our initially horrifying to the authors impulse responses for Europe in the period since uh, 1994, um, where you, the, the permanent shock is, is in red and the temporary shock by construction is in blue. So how might we understand this? Our hypothesis is that the positive aggregate supply shock sets off a positive aggregate demand shock, and the po positive or negative aggregate demand shock sets off a negative or positive aggregate supply shock. Uh, shifting the two curves around arbitrarily, as I show you in the right-hand panels, is sufficient to generate a pattern that looks like this. What might the underlying economics be? Uh, our interpretation is in terms of hysteresis and, and, and the financial cycle. The fi by financial cycle, we mean that positive supply shocks set off, set off a financial response that also affects demand, and that positive uh, and that that positive demand shock is permanent, absent another disturbance to the system. Hence the uh, the, the hysteresis. Uh, consider the left hand panel here. The story would go as follows. A positive supply shock first raises output because, plausibly, consistent with arguments about the benefits uh, of monetary union, a more stable policy environment due to the euro increases aggregate supply. That boosts productivity and profitability. That, in turn, raises asset prices and sets off a, a lending boom. The lending boom increases aggregate demand. In the case uh, we depict here, even more than aggregate supply, and the result of that large boost to aggregate demand is that you get uh, higher prices in conjunction with this increase in aggregate supply. So we interpret that as the pre-2008 case when peripheral Euro uh, European countries experienced a positive supply shock, a lending boom, and higher output together with uh, higher prices, i.e. a uh, loss of competitiveness, and Oops. <clears throat> a shock, I, but not coming from here. All right. <laughs> 
<laughs> All right, so where was I? You can run the same thought experiment in reverse. Post-2008, think of a negative uh, supply shock due to impairment of the European financial system. Um, lower prices also mean uh, an asset price slump and therefore less lending. Demand uh, falls along with supply. The demand curve shifts to the left. The result is recession and uh, deflation. And hysteresism Im Im implies that the result is permanent. So um, what conclusions uh, do I draw from this exercise? Um, first, it's no surprise that the euro area continues to experience difficulties. Uh, it remains further than the benchmark represented by the United States from satisfying the preconditions for an optimum currency area. Shocks are still a symmetric uh, adjustment to those shocks, uh, not shown here but shown elsewhere, remains difficult. No fiscal federalism, lower levels of labor mobility. Moreover, the evidence suggests that while the euro had positive efficiency effects, uh, uh, the associated positive supply shock un unleashed large capital flows between northern and southern Europe, inflating asset prices in the south. Uh, the resulting lending boom boosted demand in southern Europe that created the mirage of prosperity, but also led to a permanent loss of competitiveness. Uh, suggesting, obviously enough, the need to do something about this capital pro flow problem and uh, its effects. It's all about financial markets, in other words, as people like uh, Vitor Constancio have repeatedly reminded us. Thank you. Thank you, Barry, and uh, thank you also for being inside the time limit, which is, uh, I think, a first for this uh, event. So, uh, Lucrezia, over to you. Good morning. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here to discuss this paper because it, it reminds me of my youth. It was 1993, and, uh, you know, we were innocent at the time, and that uh, we were looking at optimal currency areas, you know? That was a long time ago. It's also a pleasure to, uh, to be here for Vitor, who is my favorite member of the executive board. And I can say that because there is nobody else <laughs> in this. OK, good to be here. Um, so um, Barry's has two green conclusions. Uh, so uh, 20 years from the establishment uh, of the European Monetary Union, uh, uh, the Eurozone is still uh, further from the optimal currency area than the US is. So shocks are still asymmetric. And the second conclusion is that the euro ha area has some efficiency effects, but these efficiency effects were exactly the factors that led, led to ca large capital flows from the north to the south and loss of competitiveness. And I, I will call that the perils of financial integration. Now, that story has been uh, told before, so I'm not going to bother you with uh, my version of the story. I'm, what I'm going to try to do in this uh, um, discussion uh, is to uh, look at the data from a much more brutal perspective to try to understand what have been the big fact uh, about uh, you know the kind of synchronization of business cycles uh, in the before uh, before the uh, the inception of the euro in the euro sample and then post crisis and actually the facts that I want to uh, dig out are basically two that is very important. Uh, to distinguish between uh, pre-crisis and post-crisis. And um, I think that pre-crisis, so by pre-crisis I mean the sample of the euro from 1999 to 2008, uh, there were two big things, nominal convergence, and, uh, um, and then, uh, um, of, of course, business cycle features that, uh, according to my analysis, uh, were not significantly different uh, than in the pre-crisis sample. Now, once the crisis hit and uh, the EMU uh, you know, faced the first large shock of his existence, uh, actually things changed. And the real asymmetries uh, actually showed up much more forcefully than before. And uh, you know, there are many uh, uh, stories that one can say about that factor. 
financial frictions leading to asymmetries, procyclical fiscal policy, lack of uh, management, uh, crisis management tools, and so on. But uh, you know, before telling the stories, let me, uh, let me just uh, point to the fact. So that is uh, my first fact, okay? So this is uh, just uh, a, a measure of asymmetries. So it's uh, uh, is the distance uh, between the, the uh, growth of potential output in each country with respect to the European average. Uh, so this is what I call real asymmetries. And on the, uh, on the right-hand side, you have nominal asymmetries, which is the same measure, but for inflation. And so this is my first fact. And you can see that uh, you know, it's very important to distinguish uh, which samples you're talking about, because otherwise you're mixing uh, quite different things. So we had uh, the periods of the grade moderation, which is there in the middle, we, where there are very little asymmetries, because there was very little volatility. So low volatilities, low asymmetries, and then uh, big shocks, uh, the crisis, uh, and again, asymmetries manifested themselves. Now, it's a quite different story for nominal, because one of the main uh, driving force uh, pre-euro and then in the euro has been nominal convergence. Inflation rates are, more, are very similar across countries. And this, uh, you know, there is kind of a, a forceful international element, but there is also the credibility of monetary policy behind those, uh, uh, those facts, which is one of the things that actually was absent uh, in the, the old uh, uh, optimal currency area literature, okay? So the role of monetary policy as a forceful, uh, you know, uh, inducing in credibility and so on. We know that there are other factors, but the, you know, in terms of nominal convergence, uh, this is uh, it's important, and it's also a fact that maybe would help us to interpret some of uh, Barry's results uh, on which you know are uh, in terms of real output and prices, uh, mixing uh, these two samples. Now, the second point I would like to make uh, is that uh, real correlation across country did not change uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the first 10 years uh, of the euros with respect to the past. And here I also want to revisit uh, uh, a paper that I wrote uh, to celebrate the first 10 years of the euros before, uh, go, uh, before Lehman Brothers saying, fantastically, we are an optimal currency area. So this is the GDP per head, uh, 1970 to 1999 for the, for the average. And uh, these are, uh, this, up to 1999, uh, the rate of growth of what I call the blue countries. The blue countries are not the core, okay? Because in the blue country, I also put Italy. Italy has also always been very much synchronized with the Euro area average. So countries that in the 1970 had a very similar income per capita level have also countries which have moved very much in sync uh, through, through the sample. And uh, now, you know, this is, uh, I add up uh, a few years, uh, so this is, includes the euro area sample, and this is the average, and here again are the blue countries, so very much synchronized, not much has changed. This is not econometrics, okay? This is just a chart. Now, what about the red countries? The red countries are not just the periphery, but I put in the red country Finland, for example, Luxembourg, and so on, small open economy, which had very different uh, starting condition in 1970. These are the red countries. So historically, the red countries have been uh, always uh, very volatile. So this is, this, you know, in the, in the sample preceding the euro and in the euro, so there is this larger volatility, boom and bust, which characterize the, you know, the, real, uh, the real cycles in these countries. So now you can put this, uh, you can do a formal exercise. Uh, you know, I have, uh, I'm an econometrician by background, so I like to put standard errors around, uh, around stuff. And, uh, um, and then, uh, you know, one way of putting the standard errors around this correlation is to do the following exercise. Suppose you were in 1999, okay, and you knew the euro area uh, path of real GDP growth, okay, from 1999 to, uh, you know, to, to 2017. Could have you anticipated, um, you know, the behavior of GDP of each country uh, on the basis uh, of the past correlations, so the historical regularities, and uh, your knowledge of the future, so your knowledge 
of uh, the uh, of the euro area you know uh, kind of uh, realization of output so the answer is yes but the uncertainty for the red countries is so large that it's very difficult. Uh, and, I mean, one of the reasons why the answer is yes, that, the, you know, that, that uh, the conditional path is not significant dif significantly different from what you observe, the reason is that there is so much uncertainty because of the red countries are so volatile that uh, n these differences are not significant. And uh, OK, this is, uh, is my counterfactual. The red countries are in the circles. Uh, uh, you have there the actual path, which is in black, uh, that conditional path, which is in red, is like uh, what output would have been like if I knew the future, if I had known uh, you know, the, average, uh, the average realization of GDP. If you focus uh, on the left of that line, which is uh, the euro era, I mean, the big, the great recession, you can see that the difference between the conditional path and the actual path is not significant. So, uh, but there is a lot of uncertainty. Portugal, Ireland, Spain, Luxembourg, Greece, Finland, they're all countries which historically have had very weak association with the Euro area, uh, with the Euro area, while Italy is in the other camp. So I think the story is much more complicated. These countries were countries that started with different initial conditions, so they were converging. Again, something absent for the optimal currency area literature that uh, you know, these issues of convergence growth is completely out of that model. So that's another thing. No monetary policy, no convergence. So you know, without those factors, uh, it's very difficult uh, you know, to match that theory with the data because you know that there are all these things going on. Now, um, you can do another formal exercise is to say now, instead of putting myself at the beginning of the euro, I'm putting myself in, 19, in 2008, just before the Great Recession, and I'm going to ask the same questions. Could I have anticipated such heterogeneity? Well, the answer, unfortunately, is no. Now, the heterogeneity has been much larger than could have anticipated. And uh, here, I think now this is in level because it's, I think it's clear, but um, I mean, I don't know if these charts are visible, but uh, let me just uh, tell you the story. Uh, again, uh, you have the bands. So if you see that a, a black line gets out of those uh, colorful bands, that means that there is something significantly large going on. And uh, you see that there are two countries, actually there are three countries that stand out where the black line is outside. One is Italy, which has done much worse than could have been anticipated you know, be, you know, with the pre-Euro history. The other one is Germany, which has done much, much better than has been, had, could have been anticipated. And the other one is Greece, but we know the story about Greece. All the other countries uh, have done more or less in line with this, well, except for Ireland had a very bad crisis, but now it's back on track. Okay, it has been the kind of, uh, had a deeper crisis that couldn't have been anticipated. So that means that, uh, first of all, that the big shocks are different than business as usual. The optimal currency area is a theory for, you know, shocks uh, in normal times, while this is a chart that tells you that in, uh, you know, facing big shocks, this is where, you know, the euro area did badly in terms of heterogeneity. But it is not about the pigs. It's not about, uh, you know, the core and the periphery. It's much more complex. I mean, the, the, the countries that actually did differently than could have anticipated are Italy and Germany, beside, of course, Greece, okay, which is an outlier in these stories. So I think this is, a, um, uh, I mean, I think that uh, Barry's stories about the boom and bust and financial integration, it's a very powerful story, it has been, uh, uh, and, uh, you know, I'm sure that uh, it's, it's, a, it's a big part of the explanation, but there is another story here. And, uh, um, and this is, a, is not a story about boom and bust. It is a story about, uh, you know, countries, uh, you know, with uh, very kind of long-term uh, stagnations, which it is Italy and the countries that benefit, uh, uh, is, uh, you know, very much from, uh, uh, you know, from the way in which the crisis uh, kind of uh, unfolds itself. Uh, now, the fourth point is here, uh, uh, how did we do with respect to the U.S.? Now, I mean, I'm conditioning the euro area average with respect to the U.S., 
The black line is the actual GDP per capita. The blue line is what we could have expected conditionally on US realization of pre uh, and pre-crisis correlations. We have done much, much worse than expected, but by, you know, by a significant magnitude. So overall, we didn't do very well, okay? And, uh, you know, the heterogeneity uh, is there, but the big fact is that overall, we did badly. So, um, so you know, why are the big shocks different? Uh, um, I mean, I can, I can tell you a lot of stories, and I've been said, I mean, the stories have been told also yesterday. Uh, you know, recession with financial crisis uh, are nasty. They lead to asymmetries. This is true everywhere, not only in in currency, in currency areas. It has been true in the US. In the euro area, this is compounded uh, by poor crisis management capacity, pro-cyclical fiscal policy, whatever, okay? So I don't have to explain to this audience uh, uh, what went wrong. Let me just tell you, give you another chart. Uh, this is uh, just description, is an index. Uh, I'm out of time, uh, okay. uh, I have one minute. Uh, on the left hand side you have uh, uh, deficit over GDP, on the right hand side you have debt over GDP for the euro area as a whole, you have three recession, the comparison of three recession is an index, so I put equal to 100, the beginning of the recession, and uh, the green is the last recession. So we, you know, as a result of the crisis, we had a huge deficit, and from the third quarter on 2009, we started a huge consolidation, which had never been seen in the history of the euro area. A look at uh, how huge is the, uh, you know, of what order of magnitude is the comparison with the other two big recessions that we have experienced in the last 30 years. So this must be part of the story. Uh, so what does this say about optimum currency area? I mean, I'm not sure that OCA is, is, is a very useful model of the euro area crisis or the euro area adjustment. It does not take into account the role of monetary policy credibility. I show you the nominal convergence as a sign of you know, a powerful thing that went on. Does not deal with countries growing at different rates, the red and the blue countries. Does not deal with financial disruption, at least not formally. Okay? And uh, you know, these asymmetries uh, have been uh, you know, the result of this big you know, financial 2008 shock. So conclusions. It might be that the euro area is dysfunctional, but for reasons which were not anticipated by the OCA literature, uh, to function, we need to strengthen the governance. Uh, I agree with Barry. It might be a lot. Of, might be about finance. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Lucre.